Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, welcome to uh, this fall's first HLS Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum. Uh, the Rappaport Forum was launched in 2020 to promote full, open, and vigorous discussion, the goal being to promote the respectful clash of ideas about critical, complicated, pressing issues that face our community, our country, and the world. It's made possible through a generous gift from the Rappaport Foundation, and it builds on the legacy of the Harvard Law School Forum, which Jerry Rappaport founded in the wake of, world War, of the Second World War to provide aspiring lawyers with regular opportunities to engage with ideas and issues connected to the study of law in a rapidly changing world. Jerry Rappaport sadly passed away in 2021, but his many contributions to this law school and to American public life will live on for generations. I want to acknowledge and thank Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport, who is here today, for so many decades of support for Harvard Law School and for their commitment to civic discourse, and in particular for their generosity in that endeavor. We have a perfect topic today uh, for the theme of promoting civic discourse about difficult questions, because today's conversation is a civic discourse about civic discourse. Um, the topic is censorship, content moderation, and the First Amendment. And we have with us two very distinguished speakers and participants who are genuinely the most sophisticated experts on these topics, who have nuanced and complex views, and who nevertheless know how to have fun and know that having fun requires sometimes mixing it up and disagreeing and not expressing the most nuanced form of your argument the first time around, but expressing it in its strongest form and then gradually nuancing it as you go. They are, uh, starting with the person immediately to my left, Daphne Keller, who directs the program on platform regulation at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. She also is a lecturer at the Stanford Law School. She came originally from the real world of platform legal governance uh, with years uh, as an associate general counsel at Google and then has gone on to a very distinguished career as an observer, commentator, and also participant at the same time in the policy issues with which we are engaged. And we're very, very grateful to you, Daphne, for coming, for coming all the way across the country for this conversation. To Daphne's left, and these are only geographical indications, not political ones, um, is Jamil Jaffer, who's executive director of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. And Jamil, I noticed you're not billed as the founding director, even though you are the founding director. Nowadays, every, you know, everything is a founding, this, that, or the other thing. Um, uh, so the, Jamil not only directs the Knight Institute, but also dreamt it up. He's also a professor, an adjunct professor of law and journalism at Columbia, at the law school. Um, and Jamil litigated important um, free speech and free association and freedom of information issues for years at the ACLU, uh, playing a central role in the legal proceedings that led to the eventual uncovering of the torture memos and has carved out for himself a uh, really distinctive, and I think it would be fair to say in, in our generation, um, our, three, our, our three's generation, unique place um, in shaping public discussion and engagement on issues of free speech more generally. So I'm thrilled to have them both here. Starting with Daphne, each will speak for a bit under 10 minutes. Um, and I just want to say a word about the two leading topics that we'll be talking about. And um, we will, I'm sure, expand beyond just those topics. The first is a set of cases that are in front of the US Supreme Court now that will be, uh, are being briefed and will be argued this Supreme Court term and decided, one expects, um, by the end of June involving laws passed by Florida and Texas that in their form regulate what social media platforms may and may not do in their content moderation. And to oversimplify, each of these laws imposes on the platforms something like the standard that the First Amendment imposes on government in moderating content. As you know, that standard, and not just those of you who are in my First Amendment class, welcome, glad you're here. Um, uh, we just had two hours of First Amendment, so those are the real, these are the real, uh, the people really committed to the First Amendment. Uh, I thank you for coming. Um, as you know, all of you, the standards that a private company and the social media platforms are private companies are ordinarily uh, held to are not First Amendment standards. 
because the First Amendment, in the first instance, only regulates the government. These state laws, therefore, would put the content moderation operations within those companies in a very different position with respect to what they can and cannot moderate than they presently are. It would require far, far less moderation of things like hate speech uh, and misinformation and possibly even ordinary everyday offensiveness than um, they practice under current circumstances. And the Circuit Courts of Appeals split on the constitutionality of those laws, and that's why it's before the Supreme Court now. Hard to imagine a topic more important for free speech in the United States today than what are the standards that the social media platforms may or may not use to determine what content can be on those platforms. And here, that issue arises in direct relationship to the First Amendment. The other is also before the Supreme Court, but in a slightly different procedural posture, if you'll forgive the legal ease. Um, it is a case involving um, an argument by individuals whose content was taken down from social media sites for violating their rules on COVID misinformation, who alleged in district court, where they won a preliminary injunction, that the Biden administration um, convinced by means of encouragement and even coercion the platforms to take down their content by fine tuning their uh, content moderation disinformation standards to prohibit what they were doing. The US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit partly upheld a preliminary injunction issued by the lower court. It narrowed it down to just the Biden administration and not people in the CDC. And um, the Supreme Court decided to stay that order until I think four o'clock today um, and gave until the end of the day Wednesday for people to submit briefs. So it's very probable that before you go off to your happy hours this evening, um, there will be a Supreme Court decision uh, on this fascinating and rich issue, which sometimes we use the shorthand to call it, we call it jawbone. Um, I don't actually don't know the intellectual origins of that phrase, because it sounds to me like Samson uh, and the jawbone of the ass, and that didn't end well for the Philistines. Um, I, I, is, is that actually the origin? I always thought it had something to do with like the fact that you talk out of your jaw, but I guess not. Um, if so, it's a very loaded metaphor. I guess it assumes a conclusion. Um, but what is meant is circumstances where government officials use persuasion and persuasion that may go up to the line or cross the line of coercive persuasion to the point where the speech, the, the decision to remove the speech becomes in law the speech of the government. And by becoming the speech of the government, is regulated by the First Amendment. Okay, So for those of you who haven't taken First Amendment or haven't taken it recently, the idea is that the government ordinarily can say whatever it likes, but it can't stop people from speaking. Private parties can stop other private parties from speaking, and they're not stopped by the First Amendment from doing so. But if the private party, the social media company, removes the speech of another private person and does so because the government made them do it, then at that point, it becomes the government's speech act, and then it cannot lawfully be performed. It would have been fine on that theory if the platforms did it themselves, but it's not constitutional if they did it by being pushed into it according to some complex legal standard by the government. Okay, without further ado, Daphne, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Harvard and the Rappel Court Forum for hosting us here. Uh, so I've been practicing platform speech law for a long, long time, and I've been teaching it for 11 years, um, I just realized. And when I started teaching it, every single class was on a topic that lawyers call intermediary liability. So that's the question of when the law can or should require platforms to take down user speech because that speech or that content is, is unlawful and it's, it's doing harm and violating the, the law by being distributed further by, by the platforms. Um, and every year that I teach for the past five or six years, I've had to drop a day of talking about that question, which is when does the law require platforms to silence their users, and add more material about the opposite question, which is when can the law stop platforms from silencing their users? Are there situations where there can be what we call must carry laws compelling platforms to carry speech against their will because a government body has decided that that's what's in the public interest. 
Um, and as we know from Noah's introduction, in these cases coming out of Texas and Florida that are likely to go to the Supreme Court soon, uh, those states are asserting the right to compel platforms to carry speech that they don't want to. But lest you think that other issue has gone away, there have been three state laws requiring platforms, effectively requiring them to take down user speech that got struck down as unconstitutional in the past two weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, so there, there is a lot of action on both sides of this. When does the law make platforms silence people? When, when does it compel them to let people speak? Um, and it's a very complicated set of issues because there really are speech considerations on all sides. It is quite understandable that people want to be able to talk in some of the most important public forums of our age, and they don't like it when a giant corporation stops them from doing that. Um, that's, that is not surprising, and while it is cast as politically an issue of concern to the right and to Republicans right now, I think it is absolutely a bipartisan issue. Liberals don't like being silenced by corporations either. Um, it is, I think, unsurprising that we're seeing the great wave of regulation right now, including the three state laws that were just struck down and, and the Texas and Florida laws, because we're in this historically unprecedented situation of very concentrated power over public discourse and private discourse. You know, the things that we once would have said to each other in a church or a bar or a note passed in class are instead passed through these private companies and transmitted digitally. And that introduces both a greater capacity for control, because they're there at all, because it's a centralized power, and because they can have tools that automatically detect what words you use and automatically, if inaccurately, uh, you suppress things. So it's, it's unprecedented power, and because it is private power, the tools to defend users' rights from surveillance under the Fourth Amendment and from censorship under the First Amendment, those legal tools don't work or they don't, if they work, we don't know how they work yet because the idea of applying them to private actors in, in the way that some advocates want to do now um, is, is unprecedented, is unexplored territory, figuring out how that could possibly work. Um, I think, I, I wanna suggest that there is a problem in the way that states have responded to this concentration of power and that this is a problem that appears on, on the right and the left. Again, I think a lot of this gets cast as, as partisan and isn't necessarily. The problem is that regulators say, wow, private companies, YouTube, Facebook, Google, you have so much control over discourse, it's terrible. We're gonna have to take that over and tell you how to use it. So instead of saying, there's a concentration of power, let's undo the concentration of power, which is conceivable through interoperability mandates or through changes in privacy law. Instead of taking that approach, the approach that you get from both the left and the right is to say, use your power in the following way. You know, use it to take down more of this kind of speech or use it to keep up more of this kind of speech. Um, and I, I wanna kind of drive home that the Texas and Florida laws, although they get called must carry laws, and Texas and Florida themselves claimed that they are um, common carriage laws, which suggests that the platforms are supposed to just carry everything you know, that people say, they actually introduced some pretty significant state preferences about speech. They are not content neutral, they are not speaker neutral, and they incentivize platforms to do things that will suppress speech as well as um, maybe carry more speech. So um, one way that that works is Texas's law has a mandate to be viewpoint neutral when platforms are deciding what content to take down. Uh, if they want to take down anti-racist content, then they have to also, they said that backwards, if they want to take down pro-racist content, they also have to leave up anti-racist content. If you pick your really difficult issue and they're supposed to carry speech on, on both sides of it. Uh, if they want to take down pro-anorexia content aimed at teenagers, they might have to take down anti-anorexia content aimed at teenagers. 
Um, what that does for listeners, if you're on the internet and you wanted to uh, follow a speaker you already respect or learn about something, is as the cost of accessing the information you want, which maybe is the anti-racist speech, you have to also put up with this state-mandated inclusion of the stuff that you didn't want. So it is very much changing what it is that users can see and read online at state behest in a way that raises questions not just about platforms' rights to decide what to do, but about users' rights to, to speak and, or rather, to access information online. It is also, I think, quite likely, speaking as a former platform lawyer, that if a platform is trying to decide how to comply with the viewpoint neutrality mandate, they'll say, you know what, I'd rather have no one talking about racism at all than have to carry both the pro-racist and anti-racist viewpoints, so I'm just going to take down a whole lot more speech than I used to, and that's the consequence of this you know, nominally pro-free expression law in, in Texas. Um, I, I can tell you more about ways in which I think they, the law is more in the way to introduce state preferences for speech, but hopefully that kind of um, sets out, uh, sets out the, the basics of it. I have about three more minutes, right? All right. Uh, I, I think there's an underlying problem here, or an underlying difficulty, which is about what in the, in the trade gets called lawful but awful speech. This is this very large category of speech, and I, I have an article in the U Chicago Law Review going into more depth on this, that is legal, it's protected by the First Amendment, that's probably not going to change, but it is also um, morally abhorrent to many people, it violates social norms, and they don't want to see it. So the pro-anorexia content, the pro-suicide content, the beheading videos, the Holocaust denial, the, you know, the list is very long and it's very ugly. Um, if we don't want to see that content on the internet, we can't use the law to make it go away. And so where we've been so far is we're stuck having private companies come up with rules and enforcing the rules that there's sort of economic demand for and, and social demand for. But nobody likes that either because of this concentration of power issue. And, and so the, the deeper question, I think, is how to, how to deal with that. And the answer can't be, or I hope it can't be, well, we'll just ban a bunch more speech. <laughs> like, we will use the law to restrict all this stuff that is currently First Amendment protected. Or there's a version of that that says, you can still stay, say all that stuff offline, but if you say it on platforms, it's more dangerous, so they have to take it down. And you know, maybe the FCC will administer a new set of rules for previously lawful speech and say platforms have to take it down. There are a lot of directions you could go to use legal power to address that, and I think they're all pretty scary. And so I, I am much more interested in approaches that go back to this idea of maybe let's not have that concentration of power. Let's build what my Stanford colleague Frank Fukuyama calls middleware, or what other people call adversarial interoperability or competitive compatibility, which is finding ways to make it so that internet users can decide for themselves what speech rules they want to be subject to, and have a, a competitive marketplace of different providers coming along, let you, letting you select the Disney flavor of YouTube or the version of Twitter that is curated by a Black Lives Matter affiliated group or the combination or something from your church. You know, there are all these ways to layer competing speech rules on top of existing platforms that I think can take us away from this idea that there has to be just one set of rules and the government gets to say what it's gonna be. Thank you so much, Daphne. Um, on that last topic, it'll be interesting to talk about um, A, whether that puts people into filter bubbles, um, and B, whether we're not actually seeing a market competition now in the way that the company formerly known as Twitter now has radically different rules of engagement than it did previously and is therefore in competition with other actors. Um, Shamil. So, uh, I totally disagree with everything that Daphne said. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's really a privilege to be up here with Daphne and Noah, who are both wonderful people and really smart thinkers on this set of issues. Uh, I do need to correct one thing that uh, Noah said. I did not, in fact, dream up the Knight Institute. Uh, it was Columbia University and the Knight Foundation that dreamt it up, and then 
made the mistake of hiring me to build the institute. Um, so, um, you know, as you've already heard, the courts are going to hear this whole slew of cases over the next few years um, relating to the government's power to influence or coerce uh, or expose the social media company's content moderation decisions. And I think it hardly needs to be said that those cases are going to have an immense effect on um, the character of the digital public sphere, uh, and therefore on our democracy uh, as well. Some of those cases have already been mentioned in Florida and Texas. We have these laws that require the social media companies to carry content that they would rather not carry. Um, the laws also limit the use of recommendation uh, algorithms. They require the companies to disclose all sorts of information to their users and to the public. Um, there's also this Missouri uh, case that, that Noah referred to, uh, where users have sued the Biden administration over uh, its efforts to uh, coerce the platforms or, or influence the platforms into taking down uh, what the administration saw as vaccine disinformation. Um, I would put into this sort of category of cases also the TikTok cases, where uh, you know, Montana has banned TikTok altogether from operating the state. And one way to think about that law is as the most extreme kind of content moderation, where uh, you know, TikTok can't, uh, uh, can't serve any content at all to its, uh, to its users. There are lots of other cases. Um, you know, Daphne referred to, to some of them. Lots of other cases in the lower courts right now that raise uh, these kinds of, of, of issues. I think that the plaintiffs have a uh, pretty good chance of prevailing in most of those cases. Uh, and in my view, the plaintiffs probably should prevail in most of those cases. Um, because most of them involve what I think can fairly be described as government efforts to rig public discourse. Uh, and that is precisely what the First Amendment was meant to protect against. But I think that it matters a lot how the courts uh, resolve those cases, how the plaintiffs win those cases. Um, I'm worried that the courts are constructing a First Amendment that sees every regulatory intervention in this sphere as a form of censorship. And I don't think that that version of the First Amendment um, would serve free speech or democracy very well. In my view, um, the First Amendment should be able to distinguish between regulation that undermines the values that the First Amendment was meant to serve, values like accountability and tolerance, um, uh, self-government, uh, and interventions that uh, promote those values. The, 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 the First Amendment needs to be able to distinguish those, you know, those two categories of interventions. And of course, it's important that the First Amendment be attentive to the possibility that any intervention in this sphere is an effort to distort public discourse, um, or that the intervention will have that effect. And I, I don't want to sort of uh, move past that too quickly. I think that's hugely important. If you doubt the importance of that, just look around the world at the way that fake news laws are being used now um, against journalists. Um, so I think it's hugely important that First Amendment doctrine continue to be attentive to the possibility that any regulation in uh, this sphere uh, has that intent or that, that, that effect. Um, but I do think it would be a sad thing and uh, something terrible for our democracy if the courts constructed a First Amendment that was indiscriminately deregulatory. Uh, a First Amendment that left essentially no space for regulatory intervention at all, even intervention that might be important to uh, protecting the integrity or the vitality of the digital public sphere. So I think it's worth taking uh, a close look at some of the arguments that the social media companies and the technology companies more broadly are making uh, in these cases that we have you know, identified already. So you know, one of the arguments is that the collection of user data is speech within the meaning of the First Amendment. Uh, another is that any regulatory intervention that implicates the platform's editorial judgment has to be subject to the most stringent form of constitutional review. 
another argument is that any regulatory intervention that focuses specifically on social media companies should be subject for that reason to the most stringent form of constitutional review. Uh, and then finally, any regulation that would be unconstitutional if applied to newspapers must also be unconstitutional if it's applied to social media companies. So it's not surprising that you see social media companies making those arguments. What business wouldn't want to be totally beyond the reach of regulation? So you know, I, I understand and appreciate why they're making these arguments. But if courts accept those arguments, it's not just the bad laws that we have already identified that will be struck down. It's also good laws. Uh, those, that, those kinds of arguments will preempt legislatures from passing uh, laws that I think most of us, no matter what our political views are, uh, would agree make sense. Uh, privacy laws, for example, that would restrict what data the platforms can collect and what they can do with that data. Uh, interoperability laws, uh, which Daphne already mentioned, that might make it possible for third parties to build on top of the networks that the social co media companies have created. Um, transparency laws that would allow the public to better understand what effect uh, the platform's engineering decisions are having on public discourse, uh, or process-oriented laws that would give users whose speech is taken down uh, the right to an explanation or the right to appeal that, uh, that decision. Now, um, I know Noah wants me to make this argument in the strongest possible way, but I, I need to caveat it in one respect at least which is that you know, the details are going to matter a lot. I'm not making the argument that every transparency law is necessarily constitutional. Uh, again, it's important that the courts be uh, attentive, not just to the reasons why legislatures are passing these laws, but to the actual effect that the laws are likely to have on um, uh, First Amendment actors' exercise of editorial judgment. Uh, but a First Amendment that precluded any and all regulation of social media platforms uh, would make the First Amendment, I think, the, the enemy of the values that we need the First Amendment to uh, protect. Um, should I stop there? Or do I have a couple more minutes? You, want to... you can go on for another minute or two. Yeah, sure. okay, well, that'll be, I Say guess. Something they... provocative. Uh, uh, okay, all right, so. <laughs> the last time I had a discussion with Jamil, we got into a yelling argument that took an hour and a half, and it's all on video somewhere. It's it's true, there were you, you weren't the moderator, though. You were I wasn't the moderator, yeah. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, the only thing, maybe this will sharpen the argument slightly. So the argument that uh, the First Amendment shouldn't make any distinction between newspapers, say, and social media companies seems especially misguided to me. Um, there's no question in my mind that social media companies exercise editorial judgment. They make um, judgments all the time about the relative value of different categories of, of speech. That seems like editorial judgment of the kind that, um, uh, or at least analogous to the kinds of judgments that newspapers make about what should appear in their pages, or that parade organizers make when they decide uh, which floats can appear in the parade. That seems like a form of editorial judgment to me. But the relationship that a social media company has to the speech that appears on its platform is different from the relationship that a newspaper has to the speech that appears in its pages. To say that another way, both of these kinds of actors exercise editorial judgment, but they exercise editorial judgment in different ways. And those differences, I think, should matter to the First Amendment uh, analysis. Um, why don't I leave it there, No, I can say more on that. Great. I, I would love to ask a question to both of you that derives from something that Jamil said, but I think it's relevant to both of your comments, and that is the question of why we have a First Amendment in the first place at all. So I think you said in passing, Jamil, that the whole point of the First Amendment is to avoid the government distorting free speech or rigging what discourse is out there in the public. And I want to push back from the standpoint of the people who passed the Florida and Texas laws. I think what they would say is that's not the main purpose of the First Amendment, although it might be a purpose. The main purpose of the First Amendment is to enable people to speak freely. And nowadays, the place that people speak is on social media. And as platform lawyers certainly know, and everyone who uses social media knows, an enormous amount of content that you might want to say on social media, you can't. It gets taken down. And the more controversial you are, the more quick they are to take it down. And so from that perspective, if the government can't tell social media 
to allow free speech. And if it can't define free speech by saying, we're not going to make up a special definition for you. We're just going to use the definition that the courts make us use. How on earth can that be in violation of the principles of the First Amendment? It seems like the only way it could be is if you think something that you guys both claim not to think, I think, which is that um, the platforms are not just like newspapers who can say whatever they want. So if they're not like newspapers, what could, be, what could possibly be wrong with Florida or Texas saying, you know what, guys? You're subject to the same standards that we're subject to. And the reason for that is that the First Amendment is about maximizing people's capacity to communicate. And you are, in the real world, the, st the thing that stands between this generation and the possibility of free speech. So I would like each of you to, to address that. So that's not what they said, though. <laughs> well, let's reconstruct it at the strongest argument that they could. Let's, ima let's just imagine a statute. Let's then just imagine a statute, which is a variant on this, these statutes, that just says, the, stent, the, the platforms may not do anything that the government may not do in the regulation of free speech. Is that constitutional in your view? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, and, and just That's to, what I thought. Yeah. So now. Yeah. So, so, and so to be clear, the difference is, so Florida says you have to let politicians say anything and journalists say anything. So it's, it's picking winners for uh, speakers um, and giving them special privileges. And like I think those are important special speakers too, but the way they do it is very clumsy. And then Texas says you have to be viewpoint neutral, but actually you don't have to be viewpoint neutral as to these things we think are really bad. You can just take that down. Just imagine they did things. it well. Yeah. So instead, we're imagining a law that says, there's a common carriage law, which is what Texas and Florida claim they have, which says you have to carry every single thing, period. Or you have to carry every single thing that's legal. And so if you know something's illegal, take that down. But you have to carry everything else. Uh, I think one, I'll get to the constitutionality, but like, man, those lawmakers' constituents would hate that. Like, they're kids and grandparents and cousins and whatever would go on YouTube and suddenly see a bunch of extreme porn or go on TikTok and see a bunch of pro-suicide videos. Like, this is not something people would actually be happy with. But set, setting, setting that aside, I think, so I, I have been focusing on the speech rights of internet users and how they're affected. But here, the impact on the speech rights of the platforms is quite visible and quite extreme. It's taking away their ability to set any editorial policy at all, which I think is clearly a First Amendment problem. It also, I think, but, would be but a But why? Because corporations deserve free speech rights? Well, because we have a bunch of precedents saying that you know the parade operators and the cable operators and so forth, various commercial entities or non-commercial entities that just aggregate third-party speech and set, set some rules for it, they do have First Amendment rights. So. I, you know, be, because the Supreme Court, I think, is, is my main answer there. But I also think it would destroy... I mean, can, I, can, I just, can I just push back? I mean, I mean what, if the, what if the Supreme Court said that a parade is one thing, because you can always make your own parade, but I, I tried to make my own Facebook, and I, I wasn't so successful. So they're not exactly like a parade. And so we're going to treat them differently. I mean, and I think Jamil thinks that they should be treated differently from newspapers. So if that were the case, I mean, I don't think, imagine that precedent doesn't limit us here, because I personally don't think that it does. Do you still think, if you were on the Supreme Court and not bound by a precedent, do you believe that these giant, gajillion dollar multinational corporations that control all of our speech have their own free speech right to shut us up? Or that's the question that I'm asking. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. I don't, th and, I don't think there why, should be, why? there why? should be more of them, right? Like, they shouldn't have the power that they do, but they are serving a, providing a service that most users want in curating the speech that they see, so it's not a free speech mosh pit every day when you show up on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook. Like, and they're doing that in expressing, they're expressing their own priorities about what speech is good and bad. In, in so doing. It seems like I agree with you. The court can just change it, you know, and maybe they will, and maybe that's the word, world we're heading for. So precedent's not that important. Um, but, but I think that there is a First Amendment value being served that would be served better with more competition, but it's definitely a First Amendment value. Jamil, and especially given that you think there's a difference between the social media companies and newspapers, I want to know what the principle is behind that difference, unless you are willing to allow the government to force the media, social media companies to allow free speech? Well, I mean, I think it, it depends. Um, so the answer for, for newspapers, the Supreme Court has already given us in a case called Miami Herald, right? So there was a uh, law that would have required the Miami, 
required newspapers to run opposing viewpoints when they editorialize on certain topics, and the Supreme Court struck it down, saying you can't force newspapers to uh, publish uh, opinions they disagree with, and um, you know to carry carry speech that they don't want to carry. And so the question is, does that principle apply? Um, or apply with the same force to social media companies, and I don't think it should. Uh, I do think that there are circumstances in which um, legislatures should be able to impose must-carry obligations on platforms, uh, even if they couldn't impose the same ones on newspapers. Uh, I'm not totally unsympathetic to that aspect of the Florida law. The Florida law says, uh, the best version of the Florida law would say, a couple of weeks before uh, elections, uh, the uh, social, big social media companies can take down political candidates' posts only uh, according to, say, published uh, procedural rules that are applied generally and not just to political candidates or to a particular subset of political candidates. Um, now, do I think that law might be constitutional because I think the social media companies have no First Amendment rights at issue here? No. I think the social media companies are exercising editorial judgment, as Daphne says. Um, they're just exercising it in a different way than newspapers do. But the fact that they are exercising editorial judgment isn't the end of the analysis. Then there's the question of, is the public justification for overriding that uh, editorial judgment uh, strong enough to justify overriding it, right? And I think you could make a strong case, or at least you know, a plausible case, that in the weeks before an election, the public's interest in hearing from political candidates should uh, prevail over the interests of you know, Facebook or TikTok in promoting the political candidates that they might prefer at that you know, particular moment in time. Now, the Florida law, I'm not defending the Florida law, the Florida law uh, I think was uh, passed in order to retaliate against companies that were perceived to have a liberal bias. Uh, I don't think there are any legislative findings in the court of law to justify the kind of must-carry provision I just described. But I'm not unsympathetic to that, uh, to that argument, and I don't think we want a First Amendment that categorically precludes legislatures from even considering those kinds of must-carry So can I push you just a tiny bit to what seems to me like it would be the logical conclusion of that view? You say there has to be a compelling governmental interest. Fair. What about the compelling governmental interest in the next generation of people who communicate only on social media, for the most part, um, having free speech? I mean, we don't have a public, the Supreme Court has said that the public sphere today is online and on social media. So if you accept that, then I can't even imagine an interest more compelling to override the supposed free speech interests of these gajillion dollar corporations. I, I think neither of you is jumping up and down about the idea that all corporations have free speech rights, but we'll leave that to one side. But the, the, the core idea would be that we can't have free speech anymore if the platforms are treated as exercising the kind of editorial control. And you yourself, I mean, I think I'm expressing a view is closer to your view than to mine. Because um, I tend to be on the there like newspapers, but I'm really trying to articulate the counter view. Once you've conceded that under some circumstances their editorial control can be overridden, why not override it just all the way down the line and let's just have free speech? And we don't have to invent some bad free speech law. We'll just use the free speech law the Supreme Court has already created for governments. Because there are competing First Amendment rights at stake here, right? The, the, um, the platforms also have rights as, as speakers that need to be accounted for. And I think what Daphne said earlier uh, about how this would actually work in practice need, needs to count for something, right? It needs to count for something that this would result in a digital public sphere that works for nobody. Um, so, I mean, that's the reason that I don't think that's a very persuasive argument. Number one, the platforms have their own speaker rights at issue here. And number two, uh, overriding those rights in the way that you describe, you know, essentially imposing the First Amendment on private platforms would result in a, a, a public sphere that works for nobody. It would be, um, you know, I go on to Blue Sky now because I want to see the views of the people I follow on, on Blue Sky. If I went on to Blue Sky and instead the first 10 things I saw were posts from Elon Musk or Jack Dorsey, um, it would be much less useful to me, right? And 
Can I, can I ask Daphne to, I'm going to ask you to dig in a little bit on that, because you also made a version of that argument, that no one would be happy with such a thing. But I think my response to that would be something like this. We have the public sphere, and it was always governed by free speech rules. And it existed, and it was fine. It wasn't perfect, but it was fine. Now we have this new phenomenon on social media, and you're saying, well, this business model can't possibly work if you do it that way. Who cares from a free speech standpoint? Since when did the you know since when since when is the point of the First Amendment to serve the interests of the shareholders of these of these big corporations? It worked fine before. It's still working fine outside of social media. So why not do it that way? And why not open to greater free speech? And then the last point is maybe even the premise is not true. I mean, the company formerly known as Twitter um, has bait, has not quite suspended all rules, but certainly my feed includes many, many things that I would not want my grandmother or a small child to see. Um, I didn't do anything different. I just showed up on the site and one day everything had changed. You could still use it. You know, it's not, I don't think it's the death of the, of the form. So I have an answer that's about metaphor and an answer that's about doctrine. The, the metaphor answer is that platforms are functioning as a substitute for the public square and also the nightly news broadcast and also you know, passing a note in class, and also just this long list of means of communication, some of which had that free-for-all speech rules, and some of which didn't at all. And, and so I think sacrificing the value that people get from platforms, you know, in those other roles in order to turn everything into the free-for-all um, isn't justified by the historical analogies. But moving to doctrine, um, you know, we have repeated First Amendment cases saying if the technology permits a resolution where the government can meet its goals by putting more autonomy in the hands of individual users and listeners, then it should do that instead of having a top-down rule. So we have this in the Playboy case, which is about cable scrambling, and the court was like, well, but what if parents had more individual control within their households? Wouldn't that be better? And because the law there had suppressed too much lawful speech without the legislature trying to get to a better means and fit between this legitimate goal of protecting children and the risk to lawful speech, the court said, no, go back. There's, there are better versions and specifically increasing individual autonomy is a better version. You get something similar in the Ashcroft case. So I, I think, like, I want to make the argument that lawmakers don't get to just ignore remedies that would increase user autonomy, autonomy and say, oh, too bad there's this major power over speech that we're going to have to take over and take away how to use. I think they, they should have to look at better ways to give users power over what discourse they choose to participate in. No, can I just also push back on the way that you frame this? Um, I think it's you who's arguing for a kind of radical departure from uh, historical practice because it's not um, it's not the case that um, you know everything always worked and now we are proposing that we you know move to a different model where suddenly the public square works differently. What the it that worked in the past is that editors exercise editorial judgment free from interference or substantial interference uh, by the government. And uh, that's an argument in the other direction. That's an argument for giving the platforms uh, the space to make editorial judgments that a lot of us might you know, dis disagree with. Uh, my argument is just that uh, that's not the only First Amendment interest on the table. The, the interest of editors and making editorial judgments is an important First Amendment interest, but it's not the only interest on the table. And so you have to, you know, at some point, balance that interest with the interest that you articulated, the interest of users uh, in participating in public discourse. And, you know, I offered one possible line. A couple weeks before the election, you could have this kind of must-carry rule. You could offer a different, you know, a different line. Uh, my, my meta argument is just that uh, the First Amendment shouldn't foreclose that debate. We shouldn't have First Amendment doctrine that says, imposing must-carry obligations on anybody who's exercising First Amendment rights is per se unconstitutional. Because, you know, that, that will uh, preclude even the exploration of the kinds of laws that you know, we were talking about a few minutes ago. I'm going to turn the subject to job owning in a second. I just, just want to say, to put my own cards on the table, I think I do have a more radical view, although my own actual view is on the other side. Um, I tend to think broadly that 
you have to either treat all free speakers with the same free speech rights the same, and therefore that the social media companies are just like the newspapers, or else that you have to allow the government to regulate in the specific way where it would just say free speech applies in all of these contexts. I'm scared of a world where thoughtful, nuanced people like you articulate reasonable rules, but then it goes to the Supreme Court, and now it's the Supreme Court who's going to do the picking and choosing of which legislative rules are okay and which aren't. And I, if I could trade the two of you for the current configured Supreme Court, I would <laughs> trade it in a second, but I, I can't. Anyway, um, let's let's turn to the uh, to the job can, can I have one? Yeah, of course. On always. So so once once again, you are making it seem like I am proposing uh, a shift when in fact you are proposing a shift. <laughs> that, that, I agree that you're that, not already the Supreme Court. Right. So that would be a shift. <laughs> but, so th think about par parade or or um, uh, if you want if you want to have a a parade or a protest, you have to apply for a license, right? If there are more than 100 people are going to participate in your demonstration, you have to apply for a license. Uh, we have a whole set of rules around licensing schemes to make sure that they are not uh, used as a means of uh, viewpoint discrimination. But we accept that parades are licensed. Um, Parades are First Amendment activities, right? But we would never accept that kind of scheme if it were imposed on social media companies or newspapers. If suddenly the government said, all First Amendment actors have to be treated the same, parade uh, organizers have to apply for licenses, so newspaper publishers should have to apply for licenses as well, we would say, what are you talking about? These are totally different activities. The, regime, the legal regime that applies to one uh, shouldn't necessarily apply to the other. The First Amendment needs to be sensitive to factual differences. Uh, so I think I'm just proposing what we already you know, have, have, have acknowledged and recognized, uh, and, and you're proposing uh, the shift. Um, let's, have, let's talk about jawboning, Daphne. So um, when you hear that, when you read the transcripts of the testimony of the backroom conversation between the Biden administration and the platforms around vaccine misinformation, do you, what did you think? Did you think this crossed what the legal line ought to be and amounted to intervention with free speech? Or did you think, no, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to, what they're allowed to do. You know, they're just saying we're the government and we really want you not to do this and we're gonna repeat ourselves multiple times. What, what was your, what, what's your, your own, if you were the judge in that case, what would you have said under prevailing legal standards? Well, mostly I thought that it sounded familiar because I've, I've, I've been strong owned by Republicans, Democrats, international, you know, like this, this is not an atypical conversation with government. The White House emails that were so emphatic, you know, they were dumb. But I, I think, and so I... <laughs> they may have been dumb, but did they, cross, did they cross the legal line? When you were being pushed, I mean, you were working at the time for Google. Yeah, so I've, I've but Did they successfully push you around? I mean, you were still Google. Uh, th they didn't, but they, like, they were running into a lawyer with a lot of economic backing. And what I worry about much more is the same kinds of communications coming to smaller platforms that don't have a lawyer who's going to stand up for them and, and, and try to push back. But I, I think the thing that troubled me about... The thing that troubles me about the, the job owning discussion generally is actually the focus on whether those communications are coercive, because... These questions... Um, for democracy. I want to thank uh, the Rappaport Foundation. I want to thank uh, everyone for coming, and I especially want to thank Daphne and Jamil for genuinely modeling uh, nuanced and thoughtful discourse, even when I tried to make them not do that. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm super grateful to you both. Thank you for being here. Thank you.